Hi, I'm Michael Killen. And when I'm not here in the TV studio being a TV talk show host, I'm often at Stanford Radio, uh, KZSU 90.1 FM. And when I'm over there, I tend to meet some very interesting people. And I've invited one of them to be here. He is the producer of a radio and podcast show, The Modern Architect, and his name is Tom D'Oro. Correct. And Tom, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Michael. Appreciate it. Yes, and I've been impressed with you. Um, thank you. Yeah, you know, and that you have a wonderful show on uh, KZSU Radio. What is it, one day a week? That yes, you're... it's uh, Monday, every Monday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay. Is that your life? No, it's Making not. radio interviews, right? Yes, it is. It's a part of my, it's a part of my life. Um, I also am a principal of Accurate, which is a, uh, we are an advisory firm for architects, engineers, and um, specifiers. We help uh, source, vet, and uh, recommend uh, building materials, high performance building materials, and uh, technology improvements for uh, the built environment. So you're, you run a service company, uh, uh, give me a chance now, a service company that helps meet various needs of the architect community, would that be correct? Yes, it's a professional service firm for architects, uh, it's called the ASD industry, or the Architect Specifier and Design Community. Can't the architects do this stuff themselves? I mean, one of the challenges is, is um, uh, time. It's really, it's really an issue of time. There are so many demands and requirements for architects and engineers that the time to source, vet uh, material, high performance materials, green material, and uh, technology is just really difficult to do in addition to all the other responsibilities they have and all the um, compliances that they need to meet. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and so I, I've filled that niche, so uh, to to help them um, make that easier, make their life easier. Now I seem to have heard three functional words, but I didn't get them all. Sourcing. Correct. Are you using that in the context of, let's say, an architectural firm gets a contract to design a building, a bridge, or whatever, and they have to indicate it in the plans for the builders, I yeah, guess. It's specified, yeah. To specify uh -huh. uh, some of the products that are going to be used, the type of glass, the type of concrete, or whatever. And you, they could go to you, and you help them track down the source of materials or other services that the architect will need for that yes, particular correct. project. Yes, correct. If they, if they uh, in particular, um, the materi building material or even the technology, not often, uh, Frequently, those sort type of service or that that need is not is not uh, in house as they call it within the uh, within the firms, so there's really no, out it's basically outsourcing that, but there really isn't a, a, a an official title for who who would do that, but that's what I would do is I would I would uh, help them source the material they're looking for, um, and also find the technology expert um, mm -hmm. who can who can work on a project. I, I like to work on a kind of a I look at everything in a Per project basis. Per project basis. Yes. Okay, and you're a helper. Most definitely. Sure. And did I hear the word vetting? Correct. You did. What do you, I know what a vet. Somebody checks something <laughs> out. How did? Do, how does it fit in 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 your profession? Vetting. Well, well, when you source, when you're sourcing the material, the technology, how you vet them is, uh, again, what goes back. We'll go back to time. Is the architects or the the engineers or the. Uh, the designers or specifiers, they don't have that time to, to look at it's just a ton of different uh, new material and a lot of it is really good, but they, they not only is it challenging to find this, to source it, but actually how do you how do you make sure that it's the right product? Is it is it approved through all the UL listings? Has it had a third party testing? And, and those are the things that, that I, I actually enjoy doing. So um, really? I love looking at the, all the new, you know, the, the new technologies and what's coming out and there's so many that it's hard to keep. It's really hard to keep okay. up with them all. So sourcing, vetting. What was the other one? Source, and then recommend. 
And yeah. then, oh, so you then recommend what kind of glass or whatever? Yeah, the most efficient glass, the most, you know, the most highest performance. But then you, you, use, you use something like glass. There's so many different manufacturers of glass and so many grades of it and different qualities. And oftentimes, you know, the architects, as, as uh, the, uh, the owner has specified, you know, uh, um, a specific type of glass, and the architect is not sure where I find this sort of, you know, extra okay. rated glass. They, um, they, 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 they either come to me or I come to them or both. Okay. How did you get into this business? How did I get into this business? Well, I've been involved with building materials for, for a little over about 15, 16 years and uh, with a couple of uh, companies, and I work with, with architects with it, and I would do it while I work with the architects just to kind of help them out with some of the projects, and it just got to be, hey, why don't you, you know, one of the major architect firms says, why don't you do this on your own? We like working with you. Why don't you form your own company and do that? And I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And about a year or two years later, I decided, okay, I'm going to do that and come up with, I came up with accurate because if you want to try, you know, trust is obviously important, but I think the accurate was like, you got to be on point all the time. And I like to say in my business, whether I like it it's, it's, or not, we have a, I have a, a, a very thin margin of, for error with the people I work with. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to be an architect? No. I have no desire to be an architect. What did you want to be when you were a little boy? Uh, I don't think I had any, any occupation in mind. I just, um, I went with things that I really liked and enjoyed, and a lot of it was the, what's called the built environment. I've always been fascinated with the materials that's used and the technology involved with uh, uh, the built environment, meaning homes, buildings. Built in? <clears throat> built, built environment. What's that mean? Built the the in... built environment is, is the, the, the total, um, uh, the envelope uh, of, of a building, whether it's a home or a commercial building or any venue, it's, it's, that's called the built environment. It's what we live in our homes, our houses, our streets, our cities, our coffee shop. It's a built environment, and I've always been fascinated with the, the look of it and uh, what, what do they use that's, that's efficient, effective, and uh, sustainable. Shortly, I'm going to do a show with a group of people who are on a team helping to prepare California for disasters like the next great earthquake. And buildings, reg regulations, etc., mm -hmm. very important. Have there been any recent developments to help make buildings more seismic resistant? Correct, or, yeah, there are. There, there's a, there, there are a couple uh, instruments. I won't name names of companies, but uh, um, they're able to look at buildings as if uh, the equivalent of an MRI machine. Are you familiar with the MRI machine for, for uh, health? I, I just or had an x-ray? They looked at my brain recently. <laughs> I, I really, they did. Yeah. What'd they see? They found a hole. <laughs> they really did. But okay. that's okay with well, me. Wait, wait, anyway, so you take that technology that you, they use to find the hole. Well, that technology exists several places for buildings where you can take, a, a, um, um, you can actually gauge and measure an entire building like you can your, your brain or, or your knee or, or like an x-ray where you can see throughout the entire building. Um, they're actually, Stanford's uh, doing a few, a really a couple of interesting things that I'm not at liberty to share with, but you can actually see through a building. So usually you have to measure everything and, and yeah. quantify all the, all the materials, but these, these, uh, these machines actually see through it like an x-ray. They can, they're, they're so fine, they can even see the, um, uh, the inscription of the number on a nail head. So they can then see possible areas where a fault. Fractures, fissures, yes. That are already occurring. That have occur are, are occurring, have occurred, and will occur. And, and then they can do something proactively. Definitely. Before the, before the earth shifts. Yeah, well, it will shift. It's what are you going to do about it before it does shift, or knowing it's going to shift. Okay. Now, I also would like to ask you, what it, is the big development in helping to make buildings more energy efficient? What is the big, say again? The big development, huh? Yeah, the big advancements well, the, so, to make buildings more energy efficient. Well, a lot of uh, appliance companies have done a really good job um, of making their, their appliances more energy efficient. The mechanical structure of a, of a building is uh, a lot more, it's uh, changed significantly, say, in even in the last five years. Um, there's uh, lighting. Lighting is a lot more efficient with LED lights. There's a number of uh, really good manufacturers that produce uh, high-quality LED lights. 
So there are a number, just about every, every facet of a building you can imagine, there are, there are improvements, and there continue to be improvements. Would the big improvements be in the area of air conditioning, heating and air conditioning, as well as lighting? Are those the two, or where is insulation? Uh, insulation is, is in there as well. Um, one of the challenges uh, of, of, a, of every home or every building is what's called indoor air pollution. And indoor air pollution is actually, it can be worse actually has been quantified in some cases, in many cases, as worse than what's outdoor pollution. Really? And that, yeah, those are things like, you know, the type, the paints that are, that have been used, or the, uh, the ventilation system, um, you know, air ducts are not clean. Um, you know, it's basically, you don't, you're not, you're, we're not all living in what's called a healthy building because of those factors. Okay, wonderful. And, you know, there's great concern here in California, and I guess in other parts of the world, for housing, you know, it's very hard for people to find a place to live here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And if they do find a place to live, it is extremely, relatively speaking, expensive. Are there any good developments that you can mention uh, to get housing, housing that costs less to put in place? Yes, and yes, yes there, there are solutions for that. Um, there are a number of um, what they call modular um, structures. Um, where they're pre pre-made in a, typically in a, in a factory, uh, it's housed. So the the modular the modular modular buildings are one. Um, I don't know if you want to name companies, but I they're don't care. yeah. There's a company out of Austin, Texas called Casita, and Casita has built basically the the modular unit as a, as a product, not just an actual building. So it's it's really plug and play. All the all the it's it's energy efficient. It's got all the smart technology into it, and um, it's uh, relatively uh, afford, not even relative, quite affordable if you're going to compare it to the Bay Area prices. You simply need you know the land to place it in, which is definitely going to be a solution for people looking for houses here in the Bay Area. So can these what you're referring to this particular company in Texas? You know, they have a module. Can I hook another module, another module, and wind up with an apartment building? Or yes, you can. Yes, really? you absolutely, you absolutely can. Okay, that's uh, quite interesting. So Certainly. you have two professions. Would I be correct to say that? Three. Three. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. actually a father as well. <laughs> you call that a profession? Absolutely, especially if you want to try to do it right. <laughs> How many children do you three have? Three children, three, three kids. children. I know you have a 15-year-old girl, daughter. 17, 17, Seven. 21, and 14-year-old uh, uh, son. 14-year-old son and two girls? Yes. Oh, and are they and heading? And my wife, yeah. And a wife. Oh, good to have one of those. <laughs> are yeah. the kids heading off to college? Yeah. Uh, daughter, 21, is uh, 17, and my 17-year-old is still a senior in high school. The she will be, yeah. The 21-year-old has gone off She's been in college, yes. And she's also a, uh, in a in profession as well. She's a professional. Would you like to say what that is? Sure. She works at a, a firm um, in Redwood Shores called Imperva. And she works in in marketing. I don't know the specific title, but it's, she's in marketing. Dad, she's in New York. She's in New York as we speak. Dad doesn't know the specific title no, of the I don't. work. That's special. Uh, okay. Uh, she's dynamic. Okay, so you have you consider raising children extremely important. That's good, and you are the head of this architectural service firm called Acura. Accurate. 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 A-C-C-U-R-A-T-E. Accurate. Ac accurate. <laughs> Forgive me, you know. <laughs> we'll get it right. All right. And, and now you have a third profession, and I think I know what it is. You are a radio talk show host. Would, yes. Would that be correct? Yes. And Radio talk show host. Producer and radio talk show host. And you do this at the same place I, I make some shows. Yeah, KZSU Stanford. And you like being a radio talk show host. I love it. I don't Why? like it. <laughs> I love it. Why? Why? Well, that's a good question. I never thought why. It's just that it's, uh, it, it's great to engage with the architects and the engineers in a, in a lighter in a lighter setting. Um, and uh, I, I think it's also nice to be around in, in the station in the environment to ask them questions about their, you know, their profession. What are kind of their concerns? What are their joys? What are their struggles? And those aren't the typical questions that you can ask on a work or job site. Okay, so you like 
interviewing architects, okay? Yeah. Or and, civic leaders, you know, we have mayors, so, uh, you know, heads of what, uh, building departments. What do you get out of interviewing a mayor? I mean, you, are you going to really learn anything? Oh, absolutely. What do you, what do you learn, yeah, for yeah. example? Well, what you, what, well there's several, a couple of things you can learn. One is you learn that they're, um, they're human. What I mean by that is that they, you know, they're, they're, they're people as well. They're not, just, they're not just mayors or a stature that we all kind of look up to or get upset about. They're, they're people with concerns, and in, in, in every case, they deeply concern a lot more than I would have ever thought as a, uh, um, just seeing them uh, from the outside or objectively. And uh, you get to see what, you get to hear what kind of policies and projects they're working on for the city to make it better. Sure. And I guess you get to see that these people really care. For sure. Yeah, I'm, All of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, on my show, the television show, you know, I have had mayors, uh, senators, etc., and, and also on the radio show at Stanford to the extent, and I am always impressed at how dedicated a lot of these political leaders are. They really have our best interest. Yeah, I would, I would say so, and that's not just to, you know, um, you know, pat them on the back. I, th I think so, more so than I would have ever thought had I not had the show. You get to you really get to engage with them on a personal level, and so you do an interview every week. Every week, every every uh, we record on Thursdays, and the uh, it's broadcast on Mondays. Okay, so you record it, and then everyone goes into the studio on Thursday. Yeah, we record on Thursdays. In one of those little rooms, I think. Yeah, sometimes it's the little room, or if you ha if you have a, a, some multiple guests, then it's obviously in the larger studio, so we all mic'd up. So when you sit down with the guest and the microphones go on, the recording devices go on, do you get a little anxious? Anxious as in uh, nervous? Yes. No. I wish I did. Well, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm actually excited to talk with them. I, 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 I anticipate every, every guest that I have. Eh. All right. And have, do you have very specific pieces of information that you want to get out of that particular guest. Yeah, we have uh, several topics that we that we like to discuss or we coordinate before we meet uh, topics that we we'll, we'd like to cover and sometimes we we cover we don't cover the topics, we cover more topics. Is it's rather fluid, it's fluid. And it's a half it's an hour show. One an hour, one hour show. Do you ever run out of questions? Do I ever not ever? There's actually every. I just said this with our guest, um, with our guest uh, today. We recorded. Is uh, I never. I'm never able to ask them all the questions I want. It always feels like the, the interview is short, or it's 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 uh, it, it ends too quick. Even though it is a full hour, or about 52 minutes, I think. To be effective, have you developed any frameworks for thinking about how you approach a particular interview? Yes. Yes, I like I like to start with some of their early inspirations. Okay. Yeah, that's really a, that's a, that's part of the framework. And the other one is maybe um, I like to start with something something funny. It may could have happened either. I like to keep it professional, but something even coming to the station. There's always something just to lighten it up and to, and and, uh, and uh, I've found that it actually keeps the audience and listeners more engaged, especially at the beginning. Like, what, what's this going to be? You know, what's the topic going to be, and who is it? So you always like to to ask the guest about something in their past. Early it, inspirations, it, I call what it. What in, inspired them to become an architect or inspired them to want to be a mayor or a council person? Correct. That's it. Yes. Uh, didn't I ask you? Did I ask you? You asked early in the first part of our interview. You know, what, what may have, what, did you want to be an architect? And I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was always more, um, fascinated and curious about the materials that are used in a project because I felt the materials and the finishing the finish actually um, form the uh, the emotional effect of the building and the function okay and now I, I want to share that you know I also have my projects that are not necessarily radio or TV, mm -hmm. or in, and, and I have to study different things, you know. And I have used my facility, or my capability of being a talk show host, to get people on my show 
who had the knowledge that would help me and also help my audience, help me understand my projects or understand how to proceed with my projects. I've, I've used television and I now use radio talk show to educate myself. Interesting. Do you do, you do that? Yeah. You're always, I think, uh, what's the adage in, is uh, when, you, uh, when you teach, you actually learn more. Have you heard that? Uh, you heard yeah, that? I, I totally believe it, yeah. Okay. Now, um, so you don't get anxious when you're about to do an interview. As I said, no, I don't. I even try to force myself because I've heard if you're not nervous, something's wrong, and I go, gee, maybe there's something wrong. Right. But, then, <laughs> but then you're recording. What if it's live? Uh, I'm not too sure. We're, we're live here. We're live yeah. here. Um, you, just, you just go with it, you know. You go with it and you adjust. Okay. And so you interview architects, and people in their environment as well, suppliers of different types some, of... Some different materials, uh, influencers. It's actually the, the, the yeah. brief description is um, architects, influencers, uh, and civic leaders committed to positive and sustainable cities, communities, and lives. Good. And you have a sound technician with you. Correct. Our recording engineer, Akshay Jaggi. Akshay... Oh, he's actually your Akshay, yeah. Akshay oh, Jaggi is the training the, director. Well, no, he's actually he's the assistant general manager as yeah. of right now. And he's your. Uh, he definitely is. Well, that's very interesting. And you and I briefly talked about why it's good to have a sound uh, person. Oh, take absolutely. Care of yeah. Because I do it without that at this point in time, and I, and so if I'm interviewing you on the radio, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the time. I'm thinking about the last question I'm going to ask you. And then at the same time, I'm thinking about where do I go when the interview ends? Do I put on CD number three? <laughs> and, or is it CD number four, uh, two, one, turntables? Uh, and what songs are, are all uh, lined up? And it is a distraction. Yeah. You know, because you've got to think. You know, and then end it with you and go, okay. How do you deal with it? How do I deal yeah. with it? Well, that's a good point. I get very intense on an interview, really intense. I tend not to hear anything else going on, and then I have to start to get out of that. And I have a piece of paper written, and it says, go to turntable three or two next you know so when my question is finished i'm hitting the buttons for <laughs> this and i have now lost track of what song it is and and i just yeah. yeah you know i take since i'm an interviewer i for me the interview is much more important although i love i really am passionate about music um yeah. i know what's happening in the interview i don't necessarily know so much what's going to happen with the music, but I'd like to ask you, <clears throat> what advice do you have for people who would like to be a guest on your show? How is the best way for them to articulate something to you that would motivate you to say, yeah, I'd like you to be a guest on my show? Yeah, I, I look for, um, I don't have a formal uh, checklist, but uh, really one of the most important is their uh, I call them a luminary in their, in their respective field. And that is someone who's always um, at the cutting edge of their respective field. And they are all, they're reaching, they like to reach out to show you know, what their skills or talents are. And uh, they, they've got a certain, um, um, what's the word, their effervescence about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that really resonates with the, with the audience. I don't think I'm certainly it does. And then it works well when, we, when we're engaging with each other. So I sort of heard three things there. You like people to call you, for example, or you identify people in your environment who are leaders and they're sort of at the edge. And, and these are people, that, being a leader, I think you have to be a visionary because you've got to know where the path is or at least decide where it is. 
So you're looking for people. So if I was to call you and if I wanted to be a guest on your show, I would have to it'd be good if I demonstrated some vision, some, some avant-garde thinking, right? Yeah. And, and a sense of humor. And it's, oh, you like humor. Oh, yes, a sense of humor. You don't always get it, but you, you look for it. And if they've got a little, even if it's just a touch of sense of humor, it's not unusual once we get in the interview that they, uh, um, it really comes out of them. And it, it, it really lightens up the, uh, the seriousness with, uh, of which the, the projects that they've done. I mean, these are, some of them are some of the tallest buildings in the world. And uh, when, when you can talk and laugh about some things that happen while they're working on the tallest buildings in the world, um, that really makes you want to listen and say, here, well, what's more, you know? Okay. And I also <clears throat> heard, uh, we're only going to have time for this other point you made, you like people who are ready to share and talk about what they're doing and what they think is important. Would that be? Yeah. And because, you know, we do have these architects out there. and. They are at their desk 40 hours, 60 hours a week, and they're doing the arithmetic and all of that. And, and, and that's not, you, you need the kind of people, <laughs> want the kind of people who are out talking, engaging, talking about ideas and everything. As much as possible. And I, and I seek those out. And I've seen, a, I've met a, a number of people, guests, professionals over the years to know what, what uh, you know, how, are they that way? And not just not just sitting at the machine all week long, but they actually like to engage with the community. The name of your show is the Modern Architect. How do people reach you? Uh, they can either via email or uh, phone. Yeah, but they can log on to to uh, KZSU Stanford Radio, and they see the Modern Architect yeah, well, there. Yeah, we have a we have an underwriter for our show, and all our shows are are aired, broadcast on the radio. Uh, Mondays uh, 10 to 11 a.m. and they're also available online and once they're they're played online they're also archived with uh, our underwriter which is Modeler so it's modeler.com slash okay. modern architect. Say your last name. First name again, Dioro. Tom. Tom Dioro. All right. Dioro. You got Thank it. Thank you. Hi. I'm Michael Killen and my guest was Tom Dioro. Thank you.